This webinar has been designed for after-school providers and presents ideas for physical activity programming. The Teaching Games for Understanding TGFU, model used throughout this webinar is effective for children and youth of all ages and especially for participants in after-school programs with learning disabilities. The Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Sport MTCS, thanks the YMCA Academy for the expertise provided throughout the session. We feel that the main learnings from this webinar for our after-school providers are the following. It is possible to run an effective physical activity program with participants who have learning disabilities. TGFU is a model that can be used in an after-school setting and meets the needs of participants in all communities. Planning physical activity sessions that are appropriate, meaningful and fun is important. Modifications and adaptations to physical games are necessary and should be incorporated in planning. My name is Nicole Clement. You guys can just call me Nicole. At our school, the students call me Nicole. And uh, this is Zari Demergi. Um, I put our qualifications up here because nowhere does it say PhD. We're both classroom teachers. Welcome, everyone. Um, we're from the YMCA Academy. So we're going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the phys ed program that we um, provide to our students. Um, through, we actually teach the phys ed course. We, we teach at the high school level. The YMCA Academy is uh, a program that runs for grade nine and grade 12 students. Um, so we teach grade nine, 10, 11, and 12 phys ed, but we've, we've adopted this TGFU program. So we've been invited to talk to you about the program. We didn't develop it, we're implementing it. Um, and so we're gonna talk to you about a little bit about how we do that. What we want you to know is that we're not asking you to go back to your program and rethink everything. We're just gonna ask you to go back to your program and maybe <coughs> recategorize things. Um, it's not a reinventing of the wheel, it's just a replacing of the wheel. Um, but I did wanna talk a little bit about our school so that you had a context for why we developed this program and so that you might see how it might fit into the programs that you run. So our school is really, really small. Um, our, at capacity, we, we would only have 60 students from grade nine to grade 12. Um, all of the students at our school have an identified learning disability, and a lot of people don't know what that means. Essentially, it means someone with average to above average intellect, so no developmental delays, but with a barrier to learning. So some of the typical um, you know, TV variety learning disabilities would be like dyslexia or dysgraphia. So what's important to know is our kids are highly intelligent. So if we were trying to play games that were too simplistic for them, they would call us on it. They want to have a high school experience. They want to go back on the weekends and tell their friends that they played football and, and soccer and, and basketball. So um, what we need you to know is that this program works for our kids. In a, in a classroom of um, 15 kids, we probably have you know, student number one who has Asperger's syndrome. Asperger's syndrome is on the autism spectrum. Um, so this is a kid who really struggles with transitions or stimuli. This is a kid that you'll have in your room saying, it's really loud in here and I can't hear you. Or, um, you know, they'll kind of just shut down because it, it, it's just too much in the gym. Or they're the kid that's going, what's next? What are we doing next? Like, what's happening? When? And then you'll say, in five minutes we'll play. And they'll be like, five minutes is up. Five minutes is up. And so these are the kids that really struggle with transitions. Um, student number two might have gross motor issues. So, you know, in the classroom they present normally. You get them in the gym and they really have a hard time, you know, overhand throwing a ball and catching a ball. And you're thinking, oh my lord, how am I going to have this kid participate with student number one who's totally fine at playing this sport? Um, student number three maybe is a slow processor. So you give them the instructions. It takes them maybe a whole day for them to have those instructions fit in. But you've given them the instructions and then you've asked them to go out and play this game. So they're the kid on the field that's like looking the wrong way and trying to figure out when you ask them the score, they have no idea what's going on. Um, but if you play the game again, the next day they get it. Um, student number four has attention hyperactivity or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And maybe they're medicated. And by four o'clock when you see them, their medication has worn off. So, you know, with all best intentions, their impulsivity is you know, 100%, and they're doing really unsafe things. And when you talk to them about it, they get that it's unsafe, but they're just, they don't have control of their, their impulsivity. Um, and so it's really challenging, because you don't want to be the one that's nagging on them all the time, but at the same time, you need them to be safe. Um, student number five is your self-conscious student who 
comes to gym class and says, I forgot my gym stuff, or I don't have my shoes today, or my stomach hurts, or I twisted my ankle, um, they probably had a maybe traumatic experience in gym class in elementary school, or um, they just know that they're not very good at playing sports, and so they're embarrassed. Um, and maybe their coping skill is to be really oppositional. Um, it might come off as being defiant, sometimes even a little rude. They're definitely probably loud, and they probably have some sway in the class. And so they can change the dynamic of a group. So can you guys raise your hand if you have any of these profiles in the programs that you run? Yeah, they're pretty typical. So what we're hoping is that these are the kids that we teach, and this is the program that has worked for us. So we're hoping that you can pick up some tips and, and maybe implement some of this and actually serve these kids. And, and you'll see them having a good time and, and participating. OK. So I just want to throw out a disclaimer that we're about to kind of present in two hours what would typically take someone learning this stuff nine months and then a few years of actually implementing it. So you know, we're going to throw a lot at you, but hopefully you, you see the consistency of our message of how this works for any group of students. So the idea of TGFU kind of had its origins in the 60s uh, when it was noticed that students were kind of getting disenfranchised with just the skill portion of doing sports, so learning how to do a bounce pass and a layup in basketball and whatnot. But it didn't really get developed until the 1980s out of the UK by two gentlemen named uh, David Bunker and Rod Thorpe. And what these guys noticed was students who were graduating from high school and leaving physical education classes lacked something we call physical literacy. So you guys know about regular literacy, so if, you know, how well students can read and comprehend words. Uh, you've heard of numeracy, which is how you deal with numbers and understand numbers. And physical literacy is basically, you know, how do I use my body in a given space and do certain things. And this resulted, they found out, from exactly what uh, was noticed in the 1960s, that students were just learning skills, okay, or the how of a sport or an activity, but not really understanding the why, okay? And that's the message we're gonna try to get to you guys today, is the TGFU starts with the why of the game, so getting to understand the game, and then worrying about the how, developing of the skill, okay? And through this program, students kind of get an appreciation of games, and this kind of helps to enhance their uh, skill level. Okay, so taking a look at the model. What's the first question that students ask when they come into a gym, whether you're a phys ed teacher or uh, an after school program director? Maybe it's the question you ask your phys ed teacher or your friends ask the phys ed teacher. What do you guys think is the first thing that these students are asking? Okay, what are we going to do and specifically what are they concerned about? Okay, someone said over here, are we going to play a game today? Okay, and this is where TGFU actually starts. Okay, so are we going to play a game today? Yes, you're always going to play a game with TGFU. Okay, so I'm going to hand it over to Nicole who's actually going to introduce our first get out of the chair and uh, do some physical activity uh, portion by describing a TGFU game for you. So we thought that instead of actually talking to you about these games, we'd play a game. Um, obviously, we're in an auditorium, so we picked a game that might work here. That's not to say that there aren't going to be flying <laughs> objects. So if you have a problem with flying <laughs> objects, you need to move out of the line of fire, which would be essentially our pitch right here. We're going to play a game called Junkyard. All of the games that you see today um, are from a website called PlaySport, um, run by Ophia. Um, so they're there. Um, we picked one that we thought would work in uh, the auditorium, the space that we have. So I'm going to ask you to volunteer someone at your table to get up and out of their seat. Uh, I need three people standing behind these pins and three people standing behind those. <coughs> so this game is called Junkyard, and there's fancy words for things that you see on the floor. Um, the pylons on either side are called skillets, and the junkyard is the junk in the middle. Um, we thought this game was good because it means that you can play this game with probably stuff that you already have in your program. Um, it means you don't have to beg and borrow equipment. Um, so we're going to get this game started. So the game goes like this. Two teams face one another on either side of the junkyard. Um, we have planned for three skillets, but Zari added five. I think that he probably thinks you guys need a bit of a challenge. Um, what we're going to ask you to do is slide a bean bag through the junkyard and knock over the other team's skillets. So what will happen is, 
One team will start, the other team will retrieve the bean bag and send it back. The first team to knock down all the sk skillets wins. There's a couple of rules though. One, you have to throw underhand. And two, the bean bag must stay in contact with the floor the whole way through. Okay, so here you go. All right. Yeah, yep. looks like it. through the, the presentation today, but I'm going to turn it back to Z. Okay, so as, as I said, TGFU starts with a game. And what this does, it provides a hook, right? Since these students and youth want to play a game, well, that's what we're going to give them. You know, often as teachers or even a presenter, when you're presenting any amount of information, you want to get your audience excited about what you're doing. Now, in most subjects, it's uh, not that practical to do it every day to provide a hook, something to get them excited, but with TGFU it is because your hook is the game that they want to play. And what this does, it provides you know, a fun, safe environment for these students to understand the strategies that are involved in you know, all these activities that they do and to, after understanding it, develop the skill. And the skill development just comes kind of naturally when they understand what, uh, what they are doing and why they are doing it. And what we found at the, like number one and two are across the board good for everyone. And what we found for our students based on the uh, population that we serve that Nicole went over and the types of students we have is that for those students who uh, need to know what's coming next and they have certain anxieties, it kind of takes those anxieties away from them because they always know that this is what we're starting with and this is what we're gonna do. So it provides that uh, structure for them. Okay, so what I wanna do in the next two slides is I wanna give you a general overall side-by-side -side comparison of the traditional model of what physical education or gym class looks like and what the TGFU looks like. And then in the second slide, we're gonna get down to the nitty gritty and I'm gonna actually pick a sport and go through each model and what it would look like. So in the traditional model, it's very, very teacher or adult-centered and directed. So it's the teacher that comes in every day and we generally build from developing skills and then worrying about understanding of the game. Okay, so every day the teacher will come in, teach you one skill that is uh, required to successfully play a sport, and then at the end we hope that the students understand the game uh, at a really high level. Okay, and students are assessed on their skill levels or how much they've improved and uh, how well they perform at the end. I don't know about you guys, but this is the model that I grew up in when I was uh, in high school and I was in uh, phys ed classes is we every day, you know, we do our warm up, we would uh, practice a skill or two, and then the last five, 10 minutes of class, we might get to play a game, okay? And then we were just supposed to somehow figure out how all these skills were related and why we're using them. In the TGFU model, we put the student at the center. Okay, so it's very student uh, directed and uh, student centered. And in TGFU, and this is gonna be the theme throughout the presentation, it's that it's, we want to start with the why of the game. You know, why is it that in certain sports, certain things are the same? So if I can understand why a game is played the way it is, the skills will make much more sense and I'll have a better appreciation and desire to want to learn them, okay? And in TGFU, we assess the students on their effort and how much they've improved in their knowledge of the why. I mean, it's a little more difficult for teachers to assess uh, something that's very broad, but you know, at the end of the day, we gotta think about our students that we're serving and what's best for them and not necessarily for us. So let's break this down into a little more uh, specific example. So let's use basketball, okay? I'm gonna run through basketball unit uh, or what it might look like in the traditional model and then we'll look at it in the TG, uh, TGFU model. So we always start off with skill in the traditional model. So my first day of basketball, I'm gonna come in and I'm going to uh, teach my students uh, how to dribble. Okay, we'll do a bunch of dribb dribb dribbling skills and then at the end of the class, five, 10 minutes, we'll play a game. Next day I'll come in, what are we gonna do? We're gonna learn a bounce pass. The next day we're gonna learn a chest pass. Okay, we're gonna learn an overhead lob pass, a layup, a jump shot. And then hopefully through these skills that we're learning, 
magically some form is going to occur where the students know when to use these different passes in the game. And then their performance is going to hopefully improve by the end, you know, having uh, done these skills for so many days in a row. And that if they were making one or two successful passes or jump shots in the beginning, that maybe they do four or five towards the end. Okay? And then, you know, they're going to understand how to make decisions. You know, when should I use a bounce pass versus a chest pass or a lob pass? You know, when would I want to do a layup versus taking a jump shot? You know, these are coming at the end. Um, and so students have a hard time making a connect to, you know, I have this skill, I have this skill, you know, when do I do what? I mean, I remember when I was in phys ed class, um, you know, you always have your spread of, you know, very gifted athletes, uh, you have your, the biggest spread in the mediocre, you know, average uh, athletes, and then you have your students who are just not very athletic at all. And, I mean, it wasn't as bad as, you know, watching five-year-olds play soccer, which is like a beehive moving everywhere, but you had a lot of people scratching heads, just kind of standing around, because students didn't know, like, what do I do when I don't have the ball? So, tactical awareness of the game is very, very late in the game. It's, you can see, uh, where's my laser pointer? right at the end over here. And let's compare that with the TGFU model where it comes a little bit earlier. So in TGFU, before we develop these skills of bounce passes and jump shots, we want to get them to understand the game and why you do certain things you do. So to kind of get this game sense and physical literacy happening first, okay, which gets them to appreciate the game because now they have a deeper understanding of it. And then the tactical awareness will come in decision making will make a little bit more sense. So now a student will know, well, when do I do a bounce pass versus a chest pass? You know, when should I do a layup versus a jump shot? And look how late skill execution comes. You know, we're not worried about the how, we're worried about the why. Because the why helps them understand the how a lot better. Okay? And then we're worried about performance at the very end, right? Because if these kids are having fun, then this stuff will uh, all come later. Um, what we thought we'd do is uh, the first the first way to implement TGFU is to kind of understand what the concept is, and I know that you guys have probably just heard this maybe for the first time. Has anyone heard of the TGFU model before? Awesome. All right. You are. So there are four categories of TGFU. The first category is target aiming. The second is net wall. The third is striking fielding. And the fourth, fourth is invasion territory. Every game that you pick will fit into one of these four categories. So what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to write a couple down, walk around the room, put it on the right board or the board that you think is correct, and then we'll debrief it with you. So what we're going to do is we'll, we're going to bring um, the posters up and we'll talk to you about what the category actually means and why some of the games fit into a specific category better than others. A lot of people on this side of the room that I spoke to asked me, can it be in one, more than one category? Essentially, yeah, they, they, they have the, the, the strategies or some of the skills from a various category, but there's one category where it fits the best. So we're going to start with target aim. Um, for those of you, can you guys at the back see this? I wear glasses, so there's no hope. No, nothing. Okay, I'll, should I read some out? Sure. Things that came up here are basketball, dodgeball, baseball, dodgeball, 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 uh, basketball, European handball, soccer, bench soccer, volleyball, and baseball. Okay, so here are the typical uh, examples of sports or games that we see in each category. So let's start with target aiming. Okay, so these are your games like curling, bowling, golf, archery, bocce ball, lawn bowling, croquet, and there's, there's a slew more. Um, netwall, uh, volleyball, badminton, tennis, squash, racquetball, ping pong. Now netwall is the one that confuses most people. Okay, because you have your sports like soccer and uh, basketball and hockey, which have a net, okay, but the overall strategy and goal of those sports would fall under the invasion uh, territory, but we'll get, that, get, get to that in a second. Okay? You're striking fielding, okay, not many, at least that we're familiar with in North America in this category. So you're talking about your uh, uh, baseball, which is pretty big here, and your uh, cricket, which is getting bigger, but that's more uh, popular in... Um, South Asia and uh, in, in Europe. Okay, and then there's the variations of those games that we know like soccer, baseball, and uh, softball, and we play a game called uh, Kick It Cricket, which is uh, essentially the same as cricket uh, adapt uh, adapted like soccer, baseball is to baseball. Okay, now the ones we are most familiar with is in the last category, right? You know, in North America, these are the ones that we see in, uh, in sports media a lot. So your hockey, especially here, uh, soccer, football, basketball, Okay, ultimate frisbee. And each of these 
are put in a certain category, and we'll get to understand why, because the overall goal and objective of each of these sports that are in the categories, okay, are exclusive, yes, to each category, but what you'll see is that there's a lot of transference, okay? A lot of people put uh, certain sports under target aiming and uh, across the board, but target aiming is kind of transferable throughout, okay? And we'll get to that in a bit. So let's look at each in a little bit more detail, okay? So what are the primary objectives or what is the primary ob objective of a target aim game? Well, it's to get your object, okay, either closer to a specific target than your opponent or to knock down more uh, objects than your opponent in a faster amount of time, okay? And what are the tactical strategies we use to uh, achieve these goals? Well, you know, we have to aim, and then we have to put some sort of maybe spin or uh, turn on the implement that we're throwing, or some modification to the object to get it to the target, okay? Now, Junkyard is an example of a target aim game, right? So we're primarily concerned about getting to a target and knocking down more objects than our opponents do and in a lot shorter time, okay? And we do that by aiming, okay? Net wall, okay? So these are your sports like volleyball, badminton, uh, squash, racquetball, um, ping pong, okay? So when we talk about a net, it's actually a net that's kind of in the middle of a field as opposed to the uh, ends, okay? And what is the primary objective of all these sports, right? They all have the same goal, so they all have the same why. And that is to get your, uh, usually in most of these sports, it's, it's a ball, okay, to your opponent's uh, end of the field or side of the net so that it makes it difficult for them to return. And how do we do that? Well, we try to be very consistent with our positioning and placement of the object. And how do we make it harder? Well, we put more power, we put a spin on the object to make it difficult for them to return. So what we want to do now is show you a short video on a TGFU activity that is um, geared towards net wall, and then uh, we'll move on to striking and fielding after that. Okay, so hands off. So essentially the video we're gonna show you is not our video. It's, um, there's a, a, a guy, his name is Jim Consulting, and he's uh, got a YouTube channel, and he tends to upload videos from his gym class. Um, so we didn't have time to shoot our own video, so we're gonna show you his. The following clips are examples of small-sided games used to help students understand the concepts behind net games. As you can see in this clip, we have divided the, the gym into two by placing benches with mats over them throughout the middle. We then have all the students in pairs using a tennis ball to rally back and forth. You can change the idea of the game where as partners they are trying to bounce the ball on the other side in the designated playing area. And the idea with all the lines on the floor, the kids can, can change the depth of a game. Here you see them playing with a very short court, so obviously different strategies are involved. And once you turn the game into one versus another, the kids then start to learn that I am going to try to move the ball to where my partner is not. So they're done understanding space and they're also starting to understand when they do not have the object on their side where they want to be standing, which is obviously in the middle of the playing area. So all the age levels can play uh, in these small sided games. The idea is just to make sure your kids are matched up according to, I guess, their skill level so the event is successful for all who are involved in it. From, you can use tennis balls, you can use other things that bounce, and you can even move into then taking that game a step further, and now instead of me playing just with partners, I can eventually change the numbers and the court size of this game where I have students playing in maybe two on two. So now we're also having to figure out where our partner is and how we're going to cover the floor that way which helps lead to other games such as volleyball where when we don't have the ball and we've sent it we open up to the court so we're able to see where things are and we're able to understand where we should be so right now you see them using a trainer volleyball 
only catching it because it's progressing where students then try to get to the part where they're volleying the ball and again we're still playing on a short uh, or a modified net I guess and the concepts of the game are what the focus is before the development of the skill. You also notice that when we restart these small side games we have the students just tossing the ball up in the air. It's something to keep in mind when we want to restart games try to make it simple so rallies can occur or, or balls are not intercepted in the case of invasion games right off the hop so there is some development of the activity. So you kind of saw that students were playing these games to get the why, right? So get, getting to understand what, are the, what is my objective in this net wall game that is going to be the same whether I'm playing volleyball, tennis, squash, or uh, ping pong. You know, get my object to where my opponent is least likely going to be able to return it back to me. Okay? Now he made a point where you want to match your opponents up to skill level. I'm going to tell you you don't have to do that, but I'll talk about it at the end of the presentation. Um, Moving on to striking fielding. Okay, so now we're going to break this into the two different halves of striking fielding games. So you have the striking uh, aspect. So when you're up to bat, let's say, in baseball or cricket, well, what are my objectives as a striker? I want to, one, score runs, and do so by you know, remaining in the safe uh, uh, areas of the field. And how do I do that? What are the tactical skills I need to use to get these objectives accomplished? Well, I need to hit with accuracy, with power, with speed and avoid getting out, okay? And it's the exact opposite if I'm defending, right, or if I'm fielding. I want to prevent runs, and I want to make it difficult for my opponent to strike the ball. And what are the skills that I use to do that? Well, I get the batter out by adding a spin or some modification, right? So it doesn't matter whether I'm playing uh, cricket or soccer, baseball, or baseball, all these objectives are the same throughout those sports. And this is why TGFU puts these uh, sports into neat uh, categories. Okay, so again, just like the last one, we're going to show you a very short video about what a striking fielding TGFU game might look like, and then we'll move on to uh, something a little more active. So we're playing yeah, using a four-way tug-of-war rope, if you can see it. I've designated four sections so we can have four games going on at a time and what the ropes do is keep us separated and defines our area of play. There's a yellow hula hoop where the tennis racket is in and there's another yellow hula hoop that my boy is standing in with the balls. They then drop the racket and they have to run to one pylon, touch it and on the opposite angle there's another pylon and they keep running back and forth to those pylons until the ball that was hit is returned to the hula hoop it was pitched from. And you notice those boys, good job you guys, made a relay of all three of them to field the ball and bring it in. So again, after the batter's done running, they change positions and there's a new batter every time and they're basically keeping their score. So the ball's tossed in, it's hit, rackets down, and catching the ball is not an out. The only way to get them out is the hula hoop. And he's going to get three. He did. Okay? And at the same time, I got a game happening here. Everybody's moving. So tell me anything about this game. What's good about it? Well, everybody really gets a hit. Okay. Excluding anybody, you never really stop playing, so you not just they don't have to sit there and you're like, okay, uh, yeah. it's always moving, right? How long have you guys been playing for? A while, Since half an hour, 15 minutes. Are you guys tired? Yes. No. Okay, yeah. what? Tell me what you've learned about uh, when you're in the field. What have you learned? Um, I don't know. React you have you have to, you Okay. Have How many of you are in the field at once? Three. 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 Four. Four. So what do you got what do you got to make sure when there's only that few of you? You have to spread out. Spread out good. Batters, what can you tell me? What are you looking for when you're about to hit? What about them? Like hit to those spaces? Okay. Hit to where they're not, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, when the ball gets hit out into the field, 
What have you guys figured out on a, how, what's the quickest way to get it back? We all want to do a relic, kind of like we all kind of swarm into a line and pass it, pass it, pass it, pass it, instead of just giving a long bomb. What happens with those long bombs? It just kind of floats. The it gives the runner more time to get more points. And um, then they have to chase it, and then it just kind of floats. So if you have a shorter target and a relay, that helps. Yeah. So do you okay. So that's also from the Jim Consulting channel on YouTube. So a few, a few things to note here. So you can see how students are starting to understand why they are, do, they are doing what they're doing. So the people in the field know what their objectives are and what, what they need to do, and the batters know the same. Okay? And we're going to get to what he did at the end, where he brought them in, and he kind of had a little discussion with them. So we'll get, we'll get to that in a, later on in the presentation. Okay, so moving on to... You know, like what we see mostly in phys ed uh, programs are the invasion territory games. So our basketballs, our soccers, our hockeys, our footballs. Okay, and again, we're going to split it into offense and defense. So what is the primary goal of all invasion territory sports, whether I'm playing hockey, whether I'm playing basketball or football? Well, I want to invade my opponent's territory, okay? And I want to score a point or get a goal. And what do I need to do to do that? I need to get into open spaces. I need to get to where the other team is not so that they can't defend me, so I can receive a pass and you know, move and invade into their territory. And what do I do? Oh, I just said that. Okay. And I want to keep possession, right? Because that's how I'm going to progress down the field. Okay. If I'm on defense, I'm doing the exact opposite. Okay. I'm trying to defend my territory so that I prevent runs from being scored. And how do I do that? Well, I'm trying to either defend the open spaces or I'm trying to minimize the number of open spaces that I provide for the team that's trying to invade uh, into my region, right? And I want to try to gain possession from the offense. So you can see that it doesn't matter what invasion territory sport you're playing, all the goals are exactly the same. So the students aren't learning different sets of ideas for each sport. They can all clump them together now, and that benefits them, okay? It doesn't matter what net wall game you're playing, all the ideas and the tactical goals are still the same. So it's really the skills that distinguish what you're doing, but even those have some transferable skills, right? So in TGFU, we're not worried about, you know, make sure your feet are shoulder width apart, your shoulders are, uh, your elbows are up and your shoulders are even. You know, we want that to come later. Let these kids understand, you know, why it is they're doing what they're doing, then we'll worry about the, uh, the skill. So for this one, again, we want to kind of get you up and out of your chairs to kind of show you what a TGFU invasion territory game would look like. So we're going to play a game that's called Can't Touch This. And on each of the tables is a set of rules. Um, it's actually the activity that I straight up printed off of Play Sport. Um, we're going to make some changes to it. So if you could take a look at that sheet, maybe have one person in the group uh, read out sections or pass it along, whatever you're most comfortable with, I'm going to project it. Um, what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you as a group to read the instructions and try to be ready to explain the goal and the rule of this game. Um, the sheet looks like this. On the left-hand side, I'm going to ask you guys in the how to play section, we're in a gym, so we're not going to be kicking a soccer ball. <laughs> we're going to be passing a bean bag. So that's a modification that I would make based on my space. Uh, I want you guys to notice the level of complexity. Uh, we've played a couple TGFU games. Uh, not, a, not all of them are higher order or difficult. Um, and I want you to look at the skills that the students would be learning or what, as a gym teacher, I'd be expecting them to pick up from this game. Yeah, can we have six to eight volunteers stand up, please? Um, I'm going to turn it over to Z, who's going to um, give you a synopsis of the rules and the goals, and then we're going to play. Okay, thanks. So this is what we would categorize as a very easy TGFU game, okay, and we'll talk about easy, medium, difficult, and how you would use the progressions uh, in a short while. But the rules of this game are very simple. Okay? You have an X amount of players, hopefully even amounts on either side. Okay? There's no this center, even though this is an invasion territory, we're cutting it down to bare bones. Okay? Now I'm going to tell you ahead of time what the goal of this game is. This activity is trying to teach students to get into open spaces okay? to receive the the past. So we're not even worried about invading a territory just yet. We're just worried about them to get un uh, the understanding of I, where can I be that my opponent is not so that I can receive the, uh, 
the ball. So again, like Nicole said, we've modified this. So you can use this for soccer, hockey, any of the invasion sports, but the concept is the same throughout. Um, so I'm gonna give the bean bag to one team, and all you're trying to do is make five consecutive passes, okay? If you make five consecutive passes, you get a point, and if that is done, you drop the bean bag, and the defending team will take over. If you drop the bean bag, and you haven't made five, play stops, and the other team gets possession. Or if the other team gets possession before that, you, you start uh, counting from the uh, beginning, okay? All you are allowed to do is kinda this motion, okay? You, we don't want you to reach in and slap or anything, so just kinda make it difficult them, for them to pass, but don't kinda get all in their face. Any questions? Yes? Okay, let's say you're at pass number three. This would have been four, okay, if it dropped. <laughs> okay, you leave it, the other team picks up, and now you're going into the defense, okay? Okay, so that's all the rules, okay? So start playing. One. <laughs> Two. Three. Okay, possession switch. One. Oh, nice. <laughs> oh. One, two, three, four, oh. five. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so you guys get the idea. Okay, round of applause for our volunteers. All right, so. Hopefully that's a game I think that you can play in any space since we just proved we played it in an auditorium. I like how everyone was smiling. That was awesome. Um, so we're now going to get into the nitty gritty of how can you take this program to your place of employment. So we'll tell you how we do it at our school and you can take what you think might work and you can kind of ignore what you think might not work. But essentially we're going to go um, into how we implemented it at our school. So I told you at the beginning of the workshop that this is not our idea. TGFU is a model that's out there. What, what we did is we implemented it and we'll teach you how to do that. So we'll talk about um, what a month, a week, a day, and a class will look like for us. Um, we have kind of stricter rules than you do because we have to meet the Ministry of Education curriculum, um, but TGFU does that. Um, we'll talk to you about um, what kind of questions in the video where the kids were um, kind of playing that alternate game of baseball slash cricket and they are lobbying. You saw that the teacher had pulled them aside and asked them why, like what do you need to do um, and, and put some sort of articulation to uh, the learning that they had while they were playing. Um, we'll talk about transferable skills. So just like when you guys placed the stickets on the signs you, you, know, you struggled with, is this a target aim or is this a net wall, like kind of has both or is it a target aim or is it, we'll tell you how some of those skills transfer. This is my wiki page. I don't know how many of you know what wikis are. Anybody? They're really easy. It's like a blog setup. I run a wiki page for all of my classes. Uh, I especially run a wiki page for my phys ed classes. And there's a couple reasons for that. One, I give my students a whole month notice so they know what's going on. It's kind of a personal pr preservation because honestly, if I don't, at 9.30 every morning, I get, what are we playing today? What are we playing today? What's happening today? So I do it just to get rid of that question because it was starting to drive me insane. The other reason is because parents can help their kids get prepared. So I give all the parents the wiki space. I say, this is what we're playing on that day, so please don't send your kid to school with their swim stuff. We're playing badminton, okay? It also helps for kids with that case study one with Asperger's syndrome, those kids that have a hard time with transition, any kids with anxiety, they can kind of work it out before they show up because there's nothing worse than showing up on a court ready to play and finding out that it's a game that you have no idea about and you're really anxious about um, that will kind of reduce a lot of your management necessities. So this is my class. Um, my wiki space is at the top. I leave it open. You can use whatever information I have. If you're teaching uh, healthcare grade 10 science or grade 11 biology, you can also get some stuff up there. It's open, I don't lock my wiki, um, but essentially all I have for my phys ed class up there is my monthly course, and I keep it really open. Now, Zari and I talk about this a lot. Um, we tend to think that the best TGFU category to start with would be target aim. Kind of the simplest. Can you guys name some target aim games? 
Archery. Bowling. What's the one that we play so much? I think you had it like 15 times. Dodgeball. Dodgeball, okay? So we give the kids what they want, and the target aim stuff you'll see kind of builds on the other stuff. It's kind of the easiest thing to ease kids in. Um, this particular year, we were going on a camping trip. We knew we were going to do archery, so it didn't land first. What landed next was the net wall, and that's because um, we find that starting with badminton ends up kind of leveling the playing field, and, and kids usually feel calm and comfortable while we start. So we try to pick things that are easily accessible to start with. So you'll see that I had a month of net wall. It's actually two months, but that's just September that I could screenshot. So what does, a, what does this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight days of TGFU look like? Are we like seriously playing two on two badminton the whole time? No, we're not. Um, the concept is badminton. The bigger concept is net wall. But you could do it one of two ways. So you notice I had four badminton days on there. So what would that look like if I was trying to do it TGFU style? Well, I could do it two ways. I could play a TGFU game like, you know, an appropriate net wall. Like, uh, did we, what was the net wall example we had? Oh, yeah. it was the? Balloonminton? No, yep. no, no, from the video. Oh, the, the throwing the ball over the. What was the, it called? Did it have a name? It didn't have a name. You know that, that game where the, the kids are like bouncing? So you might open up with something like that. So a TGFU style game and then a skill. We'll talk about that. Or you can just do TGFU, 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 and then build the skills in later. So um, what, what you need to understand is that you want to start choosing um, skills and TGFU games that are easy. So remember that play sport sheet I gave you? And on the top it said skill level. And this one said moderate, but Zari and I made it easy because we changed it from kicking a ball to passing a beanbag. So that's a concept that you would want to think of. You'd want to really start with TGFU games that were easy and accessible and then move to more difficult. If you don't move on to more difficult, you'll lose your kids, they'll get bored. So um, how would you do it day by day? So if, if we had four uh, days for badminton, this is how we would do it. And I'll pass it over to Zari. Thank you, Nicole. Okay, so we're going to use badminton as our example. Okay, the number of days can vary. Um, so what would we do in day one? Okay, again, all the sports and names that you see up here, we did not create. These, these are directly off of the Play Sport website. Okay, and one game that falls under the easy category is, some, uh, is called balloonminton, okay, for obvious reasons. Okay, so the basic idea of balloonminton is to have two players on the opposite side of a net, okay? And footnote here, if your youth, the youth that you're servicing are not very skillful, the net is not necessary because we're just trying to implement a certain ideology as to why they are doing what they are doing, okay? And they just have to hit it back and forth. I'm not gonna worry about telling them what the boundaries are. I just wanna let them go play and get comfortable with the game. For my student, who is just very awkward out on the field and has a hard time uh, hitting an object, so they're, um, target aiming isn't as great, well, the balloon is large, right? And I can make it as big or small as I like, depending on uh, how big I want to blow it up. Okay, day two, I'm going to come in and play a game called You've Been Served. Okay, and this is more of a challenge to themselves as opposed to an opponent. And, you know, you have them stand on one side of the net, or, again, you don't have to use a net. You could always build that in later. And I'm going to spend spread a bunch of hula hoops on the opposite side. And the goal is to serve, and again, I'm not teaching them any technique yet, I'm just telling them the goal. Serve the implement that I give you, and if it lands in the hula hoop, the hula hoop gets removed, so you're trying to remove all the hula hoops in the least amount of shots as possible. And obviously this is teaching the students about placement on the court, right? All net wall sports have the same tactical goal. I want to be able to serve it into different areas of the court depending on where my opponent is so that they can't get to it. And then I would teach them the skill of, let's say, a backhand serve. Okay, so again, we're starting with play, then worrying about skill. Okay, class three, I would play uh, an activity, uh, TGFU activity called Get Back. And in this activity, you have students, and you can be running this on both sides of the court. Okay, so essentially, you're just going to have them on one half of the court at the center. You're going to put four pylons, and what they're going to do is they're going to run to a pylon and back, run to a pylon and back, to a pylon and back, and so forth, until they've done all four. Okay, and what you want to tell them on this one is you just have to face forward. Okay, day four, if I was doing a four-day unit, if I was doing five, six, you know, I just keep adding different TGFU games. I'm playing a game which is way more difficult than the first one I started with, right? Balloon Mintin is relatively easy. I'm moving on to a game called Twos. Okay, in this, you're actually playing with a partner. Okay, one, of, one partner stands in the forecourt, 
okay, the front part of the court, and then one partner stands on the back side. Okay? And then you have the same thing on the other side. So now you're getting them to understand, well, if I'm playing with a partner and I'm not playing solo, you know, I have a zone to cover. Right? And I need to be able to communicate with my partner as to where he is and where I am or she is or I am and whatnot. And you can see how the complexity is a lot different. But again, it's teaching them an overall goal that's the same in every net wall game. So I'm going to hand it over to Nicole, who's going to kind of explain how you might break down your hour, or hour and a half program. So as we mentioned, um, I tell you down to the minute what we do. So in our phys ed class, because we have to teach the ministry um, curriculum, we have to teach half health, half gym essentially. We do a little bit more heavy on the gym. Um, and in the gym, uh, we have to do two things. Essentially, they have to have like an individual fitness component, and they have to have a group games movement and skills component. So the way that we do it is um, I highly structure my classes. Uh, I'm not a big fan of telling students, like blowing a whistle and telling students to gather when I feel like it, because I, the kids just don't see it coming. And you always have that one kid that like throws the last basketball sh a shot and like it pings off the backboard and hits someone in the head. It's like, it's, it, it's always too hard to gather the kids in the gym space. So what I do is I set a really firm structure. The, the students, my class starts at 2.30, the students know that from 2.30 to 2.40, they're doing a warm-up. I'm not particular about the warm-up. If they want to, they have the privilege of being able to go on, you know, the elliptical machine, the treadmill, if they want to run the track, if they want to play basketball, I don't care what their warm-up is, as long as when they come and meet me 10 minutes later, they're sweating and out of breath. So they know that at 2.40, they meet me at the gym. I'm not blowing any whistles, they just know. And the students will remind one another and kind of gather. At 2.40, they're on the gym floor, and we do 10 minutes of individual fitness because we have to. So we do, you know, on Mondays we'll do an arm workout with free weights. Um, on Wednesdays we'll do an ab and back workout. And on Fridays we'll do a leg workout. 10 minutes usually does it, okay? And then we do 35 minutes of TGFU. So I'm not blowing any whistles or telling my kids to gather. They just know. And they know what's coming and they know that they're playing a game as soon as we hit the gym floor. And so then we would play a TGFU game with increasing difficulty. We could choose option one where we do TGFU plus skill for the whole time, or we could do TGFU and then add on skills later on. It's really, that would be up to you and your students and what you needed to teach them. And then we reserve the last five minutes of class to debrief the activity. So just like that phys ed teacher on the field brought the kids back and said, why are we playing this? What are you gonna be able to use tomorrow? How does this, you know, how does, um, these games within a category, how, like, how are you going to be able to use these skills tomorrow? We're going to play a totally different game tomorrow, you know, but stuff is going to be able to carry over. So what is it? What, why do we play this game? Why do we play balloon minton? I'm going to move it on to Z, who's going to focus on those last five minutes of class, and what are some of the things that you would ask your students? So when we teach TGFU, we're not just throwing them out there with the rules of the game that they're playing and then let them play and they come back and that's it. Okay? We want to ask questions to engage their thinking. And you'll be surprised that a lot of the time the students will get most of uh, the why aspect of the games that they're playing. So we ask a series of questions. And typically we would, within a half an hour session, do at least two or three TGFU games. Okay? Not different ones, the same one, but we, you know, here's the game, here are the rules, go out and play. We bring them back. We ask a series of questions to get them thinking about why they were doing what they're doing or what are some of the things they had to be aware of or what could they do. Add another rule to the game. So when we were doing the invasion territory, you can't touch this. I'd let them play, bring them back, ask a series of questions, and then say, okay, now instead of making five passes, go and make 10 passes or 13 to make it difficult. Because the students will start getting bored as well because it becomes easy. They start picking up the, uh, the, the game. And so you want to challenge them. Let them play, come back ask another series of questions, okay? But how, what, what would this look like? So let's go back to the first game that we played today, Junkyard, okay? Now I'm gonna throw this question out there to the people who participated, but I mean everyone observed the game, so if you, want, if you didn't participate and uh, wanna throw uh, an answer out there, you can do that. So if we played t uh, the game as, I, as uh, Nicole described it to you, like the bare minimum is very simple, I would call you back and I might ask the group a question like, how did you overcome the obstacles in the junkyard to knock over the skillets? Okay, so what, 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 did some of the, what were some of the things that you guys did, those of you who played, or you noticed somebody do? Yep. Okay, so you were targeting, and what did you do to uh, get to the target? Okay, so he was worried about aiming, so he was thinking, well, I need to aim, I can't just 
throw this object any which way. I got to make sure it gets to my um, target. What else, uh, what other strategies did you guys use to overcome the obstacles in the middle? Angle it, okay? You're looking for angles because when we do this, I deliberately set it up so that one side is typically more overloaded than the other so that I can get students to think, well, if there's a lot here, I want to change my position and get a different angle, right? So now they're starting to use the strategy that's common to all target aim games, right? Because if I'm doing bowling, you know, they have the arrows down the line so I can approach from whatever side I want. Same with curling, right? They change their angle of approach depending on the situation, okay? So, you know, you look for open pathways. You guys talked about that. You uh, monitor, you can monitor the beanbag speed, right? After a few throws, if I see that I'm not, if it's not getting there or if it's flying right by, I got to start thinking about, well, my, my speed needs to change, okay? So another question you might ask is what adjustments did you make to your throw to get it to that correct speed, okay? And I'm not going to talk about the answers too much in depth because I'm going to cover it in the next slide, right? So, you know, change the placement of the arm, okay? What happened to the speed the further back your arm went, right? So I'm getting them to really think about what they're doing. And you can see how this is answering the why of the game, but it's also building their skill. They're understanding that, you know, the positioning of my arm is going to affect how my implement gets to it and whether I'm successful or not, okay? So using these types of questions uh, after they've uh, done a TGFU activity, will hopefully, at, by the end of the unit, they will understand that all target aiming games, you know, have a certain set of ideas that I can transfer everywhere, okay? But why is all this important to me? Well, the great thing about TGFU is that the skills you learn in one sport can carry over. So TGFU is beautiful in many ways, right? And one of the biggest ones is this transferability of skills. So students aren't learning the same, or students aren't learning something new all the time, right? There's so, these categories are so neat in the way that they collectively put sports into a category and how what we learn in terms of the why in one is applicable throughout or can be applicable throughout, not just uh, within the categories. Okay, so I'm gonna pass it on to Nicole. All right, so um, I guess I, I just want to remind you that we're not asking you to reinvent your program, but we are maybe asking you to go back and say, hey, we play these games, why don't we chunk them together? Like, when we play dodgeball, why don't we like loop that in with bowling? Why don't we loop that in with any kind of curling games? Like, let's just start chunking these things together and talking about the ways that the skills kind of transfer. So I, I'd really invite you to do that. Um, I know that the only opportunity you had to chunk um, games together was uh, in our initial um, activity where we got you to put the stick hits on. But I'm going to ask you, um, we did play the game Junkyard, and we talked about what category it falls under. Does anyone remember? Yeah, I would put it into target aim, and I, I might start my target aim unit. And would you rate it as easy, moderate, or difficult? Easy. And you could probably make some changes to make it moderate. Like, you could really make the, the, the junkyard larger, your skillets, you know, more far apart. And um, if you were going to play junkyard, where would you put it in your program? At the beginning of the programming for target aim or near the end? Yeah, I'd put it at the beginning. So you see how you can take an activity that you have, and you can just think about its placement, and you might actually get more momentum with your students. Um, I, I agree with Z. I think that when you start transferring skills, you get the kids that maybe um, can finally get something, and they feel like they're confident with it, and then you move on to another activity, and you lose them again. And this way, you can say, listen, like you were really, really good at um, junkyard, dodgeball is kind of the same thing. Like you can get out there and we can play it and you already showed me that you can aim and that you're good at planning sight lines and where you need to be. So some helpful hints from Zari and Nicole. The first one is I would really suggest that you plan. Um, the more you plan, the easier your life. Um, I would also really suggest that you get the kids involved in planning. So when I start my gym class, we don't even go to the gym or talk about health or look at the curriculum or do anything the first day. The first day I get them all in a group and I get them to essentially brainstorm about every single activity they want to play. And it's, I say, if it, makes, if it makes you active, it gets your heart pumping, like we can put it on the board. You'll probably get a lot of invasion territory heavy games because that's the games that they're most familiar with in their elementary school phys ed programming and ask them to pull some of the games off the board that they want to play and put them in the categories and then vote on them. And the games with the most votes get played. 
So I would really suggest you ask the kids what they want to play and then plan it. Okay, you guys want to play badminton? Great, four days of badminton. They're going to come out and they're going to play balloonminton and uh, twos and you know all those variations of TGFU, but you can tell them we're building towards badminton. And we will play badminton, but we're going to build towards it. That would be number one for me, suggestion. I would really structure your time because you'll lose kids in transitions. I would avoid whistles and clapping and I would just, they need to know where they're going to be. It's kind of a skill. It's an employment skill to know where to be at what time. You're teaching them that skill. You're reducing your transitions. I'd give them clear expectations, um, what I want from them in the gym, what I think is okay behavior, what I think is not okay behavior. I make very little rules, um, but safety is something that I don't bend about. So the kids actually monitor safety, you know, that impulsive kid gets told by his friend before I even have to tell him, hey, listen, you need to not chuck that ball at high speed near people's heads. So I would give them clear expectations. Um, I would also, because TGFU games take a lot of setup and takedown, I would get them involved in that or you're going to be cursing us <laughs> halfway through your program. It's all like, you know, get the kids used to being responsible for the setup or at least the takedown. Um, so Zara is going to give you helpful hint number two. Okay, so, you know, we've often, uh, I mean, I pulled this slide from a general. It had nothing to do with TGFU. It was just a general uh, phys ed uh, related uh, website that kind of talked about adaptations that you can have for sports. I'm not going to go through them one by one, but you can kind of see that TGFU has all this already included. You don't even have to think about it. It's already in there, okay? And that play sport website that we talked about that has the sheets, all the adaptations are already on there for you. It's not to say you can't put in your own, but TGFU has all this stuff kind of built in. You know, I often said, if you can't, if, the, if your students you're serving aren't that athletic, you know, don't put the net there, get rid of the net. Okay, several years ago I taught, uh, when I was teaching net wall, the kids were adamant about playing volleyball. Okay, but their skill level wasn't up to playing volleyball. So what I did was I modified it from the beginning and then they didn't even want to play the other form of volleyball because they were so successful with the modifications I made. We didn't use a volleyball net, I put up a badminton net. Okay, it's lower, it's smaller, it's easier to get the ball over. And I did not use a volleyball, I used a beach ball. Okay, so larger surface area, it stays in the air longer. So these kids were getting success by hitting it, getting it up in the air, they were laughing, they were smiling. And so when I offered, do you guys want to play regular uh, volleyball after this, like in a day or two, they said, no, we prefer this one. Okay, so without even having to worry about this and think about it for myself, TGFU already incorporates all this stuff. So, um the number, well, the first question that we usually get from people is like, all right, TGFU sounds great, but what do you do for that, with that kid that shows up and like plays varsity basketball and um, is highly skilled and is like, this is too easy and I'm not having fun? Well, there's lots of adaptations you can make for them. We definitely have those kids in our class too. So um, let's look at junkyard for example, okay? If I had a kid in junkyard that was just cleaning up, like just super highly skilled, um, I might make adaptations for them. So I might ask them to use their non-dominant hand. And when they're like, well, that's not fair, I'd say, well, we're actually not working on your aim right now. We're going to work on strategy. So I want to see how you plan. Or um, I might ask them to stand further from the target. I might increase the play area. I might um, put more obstacles in the junkyard. I might ask the students to play seated. Um, I might make them slide the beanbag not with their hand but with an implement. I might make them bounce a tennis ball through the junkyard. So there's ways to adapt it. So you would need to figure out your kids. Like Zari said earlier on the presentation, you know, you play a game, you figure out who's skilled and who's not so skilled, and then you start to plan for it and you get ready for those adaptations. This works across the board. Uh, often you have um, parents who will say, Man, if my gym class was like that, maybe I'd like it more, right? Because it's all play-based and game-like scenarios to understand the game before worrying about how well I can shoot a jump shot. You know, let that come later. So thanks for having us. Thank you.